Thank you everyone who's able to join us live today and hello to everyone who's watching the recording. This is South Face's online workshop on rooftop solar and net metering in Florida, the past, present, and future. And I am Mary McEwen. I'm South Face's advocacy project manager for Florida. South Face is a mission-driven nonprofit that promotes sustainable buildings through education, research, advocacy, technical assistance. Um, South Face works with businesses, government agencies, other nonprofits, universities, and technical experts to develop and implement practical green building solutions in homes, workplaces, and communities. As the advocacy project manager, I'm working to help reform clean energy policy and regulation in Florida. My email address is on the screen. It's mmcewen at southface.org. And if anyone is inclined to share their name, organization, or contact info, feel free to put that in the chat. Also, there's going to be a question and answer session today. So your microphone should stay muted, but please feel free to ask questions in the chat at any time, and we'll do our best to monitor those. Today, we're discussing rooftop solar and the program by which electric companies credit or compensate rooftop solar owners for the energy that they generate with their solar panels. So in the simplest terms, a household with rooftop solar uses energy every month, just like any other utility customer, but it also generates energy every month through the solar rooftop panels. So the difference between the energy that is used and the energy that is generated is the household's net energy usage, hence the term net metering. And so we're going to talk about some of the legal battles and the politics behind net metering. In Florida, rooftop solar customers are paid the retail rate for the energy that they generate. And in March of this year, a bill passed the Florida State Legislature that would have allowed electric companies to pay a smaller and smaller rate over time for the energy that rooftop solar customers generate. The bill also would have allowed utilities to impose fixed charges on customers with rooftop solar. And the effect of these two policies would have basically been to disincentivize people from investing in rooftop solar and consequently would have risked thousands of jobs in the solar industry. So Governor DeSantis vetoed the bill when it reached his desk on April 27th, but that really only decides the issue temporarily. It will almost certainly come up again at some point in the near future. And so to help us understand what's happened with net metering and to explain what is likely to happen in the future, we have three esteemed guests today. We have Jim Purical, Purical sorry, from Sun Power, and he'll explain what net metering is and how it's been implemented around the country. Bill Johnson from Brilliant Harvest will explain what has happened so far in Florida. And Heaven Campbell from Solar United Neighbors will explain why rooftop solar and net metering are important to the average citizen. So we'll learn what Florida residents can do to help shape the future of net metering, and we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. There's the agenda. And so again, please limit your questions to the chat. You're free to use the chat at any time, and we will do our best to get to all of your questions. But again, only the presenters have video and voice during the presentation. Okay, so I would like to introduce you now to Jim from SunPower. He began working for SunPower Corporation in January of 2021, just prior to his official retirement from the Marine Corps. Jim's Marine Corps aviation career began at Pensacola Naval Air Station here in Florida. He then transitioned to a policy career in 2016 through a congressional fellowship where he spent one year on Capitol Hill as a defense expert in the office of Senator David Perdue from Georgia. After that, Jim shifted his experience toward advocacy in the Marine Corps with a focus on issues related to Marine Corps aviation. Jim's currently based out of Washington, D.C., where he manages some powers mid-Atlantic and southeast portfolio. He serves as vice president of the executive committee for the Chesapeake Solar and Storage Association. He's the chair of the southeast region for the Solar Energy Industries Association, and he sits on the board for the Florida chapter of the Solar Energy Industries Association. So first of all, thank you so much for your service and thank you for joining us today. I am going to stop um, sharing my screen now and then I'll virtually hand you the mic. Great, thanks Mary, I appreciate that. And thank you for that warm introduction. I guess one, one piece of 
of information that's changed, I guess, in the last week is that now I'm interim president here for the Chesapeake Solar and Storage Association. So, um, so yeah, a promotion here in the last week or so. But um, uh, I would like to start first by telling you a little bit about Sun Power and why uh, I, I feel that it'll lay a foundation for, for the net metering conversation. Sun Power is a distributed generation storage technology and energy services company it's based in San Jose, California, but it's been around, we've been around for over 35 years. Um, it's an American company. Uh, we have uh, over 400 employees that are spaced out across the country. But we also work with 700 local dealers in every state and, uh, or at least across the country. And we have a presence in every state, all 49 states, in addition to the District of Columbia. And that's allowed us to be able to service over 425,000 homes across the country. And what we do is we offer a best, this whole home solution. So it's not enough just to say Sun Power sells solar panels, because um, although we do and we sell storage devices, we also offer the best ways to be able to cut down on customers or ex increase customers' bill savings through a, a holistic approach. And that includes anywhere from assisting with EV charging to just general power management. And we're also trying to expand our presence and our products also into low and moderate income communities. And by doing so, we, in doing so, in order to be able to achieve that too, we instituted an initiative last year that allows us to be able to significantly increase uh, our presence in communities of, uh, of low and moderate income, primarily because we know that those are the communities that are hardest hit, hardest hit in times of crisis, in times of power outages due to hurricanes, storms, and if you're talking the West Coast in terms of fires. And so um, we do that by trying to increase access. And we do that also by, again, by going down to being able to provide uh, additional bill savings. And that's where net metering comes into play. And I feel like that's why um, I, I, I'm in, uh, I'm honored to, to, to have this conversation with you. So I don't have any slides to do. Oh, I might just have one slide, I guess, that I'll present here too. And I'll push this up here right now that talks about um, how there's just a presence of net metering here across the country. And then I'll, I'll talk to you exactly why, um, what net metering is. So if you can all see that. And I want to give credit to the uh, North Carolina State here too for the NC Clean Energy Technology Center too that produced this slide that really kind of gives a good depiction of, of net metering across, across the country. Because there's been some rhetoric out there too, uh, specifically as Mary was alluding to here uh, when uh, HB 741, this bill that passed the Florida legislature in March and got vetoed by the, by the governor in April, uh, that that meter, net metering was on its way out the door, and I, I want to tell you that it it isn't, um, and it's present in, uh, in in about 39 states, in addition to the District of Columbia. So what does it mean, though, and how can it provide you bill savings? So people throw out the term net metering and associate it with uh, a uh, an incentive, a benefit, a subsidy. I love that word subsidy, right? Uh, because it's not, we, we don't think it is. What it is, is a billing mechanism. And that's all it is. A billing mechanism that allows solar customers to take advantage of, uh, well, not even just solar customers, solar. And usually, you know, we're talking about solar and wind when it comes to customers too. Anybody who can generate their own electricity and export it back to the grid or the utility system. And for that export, they get a, uh, a compensation usually in the form of a bill credit. Sometimes though, it'll come in the form also of an actual cash uh, upfront cash payment uh, in some states, but um, usually in the form of a bill credit at a retail rate. So at the same rate that you would purchase that electricity from the utility company. So why don't I like to call it uh, an incentive? And it's because this is, this is a right. And uh, if I, uh, the if, uh, you know, when they, and as the conversation starts to, as the debate um, uh, really starts to ensue, uh, the, the concept of a subsidy, uh, it's, it's not called a subsidy when the utility companies get to purchase this, this electricity 
at a lower rate than retail rate and then retain those profits, but they refer to it as a subsidy when you as customers get to hold on to those savings. So let me go into that a little bit more here too. And there are a lot of terms that I might be throwing out today and I'll start to define those terms for you as well. So like I said, so net metering uh, usually associated with, uh, with solar and wind or what we refer to as non-dispatchable forms of electricity uh, can generate electricity that you can export back. The, if, um, if, if you consume more electricity than you generate, then you don't have any electricity, any excess electricity. So in Florida, for example, you may actually generate more electricity from your solar system in the winter months than you do in the summer months. And why is that? It's because you don't have to pay for air conditioning in the winter months. And I lived in Florida, as Mary mentioned there too, for a little while, and I got cold in the winter time and I didn't have to worry about running my air conditioning. That too, right? So I was saving on my electricity bill in the winter months. So there's a chance in its pure form, net metering can zero out your electricity bill in, in the winter months. Again, in, in its literal form of net metering. And so what net metering allows you to do, again, in its literal form, is take some of that excess electricity, convert it into what we form as bill credits, and then transfer those bill credits during the summer months to offset some of that excess load that you may be capturing or that you may be producing uh, or consuming here uh, during, those, during those summer months. So it's, it just, it makes sense, right? So it's... The reason it's unpopular to some people uh, with respect to like ideally utility companies is because it does cut into their bottom line. And it's also made unpopular uh, into to, to other rate payers because as more and more people start to consume or generate their own electricity, they feel like they don't have to pay or their, their systems, uh, certain net metering systems that prevent them from actually contributing to the grid. And I'll get into that a little bit more as well. But uh, in, its, in its literal and pure form, net metering just allows you to be able to, uh, to, to access, to actually to leverage those excess, that excess electricity that you consume, that you generate, and offset that electricity that you consume and, uh, and get additional credits either at the end of the month or at the end of the year. Now, normally, it's at the end of the year for, and so in the state of Florida, uh, those credits are transferred over from month to month. And at the, let's say at the, at, at the end of March or at the end of June or July, it depends from IOU to IOU exactly when that monthly, when that annual true up actually occurs, you might get a credit um, if you haven't used those, all of that, all of that, that stored excess electricity. And that credit then um, uh, at the end of the year, when that true up actually occurs now is, is, compensated or you're compensated for that excess electricity there at what we call the avoided cost. Now, what's the avoided cost? Avoided cost is a term that is, it's the minimum amount an electric a utility is required to pay an independent power producer. And this is a, under a federal regulation too. Um, but it's equal to the cost that in, in layman's terms, it's equal to the cost that the utility calculates that it avoids by not having to produce that power. Now, things change, right? Now, things change over time, technology, um, I, COVID has transformed our lives as well. Uh, I, so people who are working remotely now may not necessarily be consuming as much electricity at nighttime during those peak hours from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And that's, uh, that's kind of the crux of net metering, right? Because you may be able to generate a lot of net, a lot of electricity in the daytime uh, when the sun is shining bright. And in Florida, it is not an issue, right? Uh, because the sun is almost always shining, except when you get to the hours of 6 to 9 p.m. And what happens at 6 to 9 p.m.? All right, everybody comes home from work. Kids are coming home from, from their after school activities. It's pandemonium. You're running the washing machine. You're running, you're turning on all the lights. The dishwasher is going on. So during those peak hours of 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., is what we call, uh, that's, that's when most, there's a high demand uh, or high usage rate there for most homes. And so there's a heavy load that's being placed on the utility grid at that time. Now COVID has changed that a little bit, right? Because now more and more people are working at home. So, hey, I can use my washing machine in the daytime now. I can use my, my, my dishwasher, run that at 10 a.m., 12 p.m. 
as opposed to uh, 6 to 9 p.m. or so. But more importantly, um, uh, that, that, that energy that I create for my solar, for my solar devices or for my wind, uh, but for some power, it's solar, right, um, can be used to offset that daytime load. What gets tricky is now you still need the utility grid unless you have a battery storage device. And most people don't, especially within the state of Florida, just because they're not cost effective enough just yet, but they're getting there. But you still need the utility grid, you still need the utility company to be able to provide you uh, electricity at nighttime when the sun's not shining or when the wind's not blowing. And so there is, there's the conundrum, right? You still need the utility company, you still need access to the grid, um, and you still need reliance. And so how do you get that? And is there a way for people to be paying their fair share? And that's where the argument and that's where the debate really kind of comes into play. Now, I, I mentioned uh, a couple of terms. I talked about avoided cost, um, but what also changes with respect to net metering is your netting frequency. So I've spoken about in its pure form, how net metering is, is trued up at the end of the year. And so those, those bill credits are transferred over from month to month and accumulated. And then, you know, you get this, this true up period, like I said, at the end of the year. Now, not all states operate that way. So Florida does have an annual true up period, but states like, uh, like Nevada um, has, have a monthly true up period um, or, or Arizona also has something referred to as net billing. And I'm gonna get into the difference between net metering and net billing. So net billing is, is just, it's the same thing as net metering, except instead of being compensated at the retail rate, now you're compensated at a rate that's a percentage of your retail rate. So something that's lower, but it's still higher than that minimum payment, what we call avoided cost. So um, uh, net metering, net billing, uh, you know, uh, so like state of, of Arizona, for example, which has net, net billing, um, credits customers at rates somewhere between five to 30% lower than retail. And it also imposes systems, so Arizona imposes system sizes, uh, your system size for your solar system can exceed more than 125% of your customer's total load, can, uh, total connected load. Um, in the states like North Carolina and South Carolina, they just recently, well, North Carolina is going through a net metering proceeding right now, about South, South Carolina also instituted uh, a net metering policy too that allows for monthly net metering. And so what monthly net metering is, is just, you know, rather than accumulating your credits there from month to month and carrying them over from month to month, now you're just basically looking at a shorter frequency. So you get your credits at the end of the day, and you, you carry them, those credits over day to day, and at the end of the month, it is trued up, and you might see savings on that following month's bill cycle. But we do notice that every time the frequency increases for net metering, meaning that if it goes from uh, annual to monthly, then the level of savings change as well. And the worst case is what we refer to as instantaneous net metering, because it's really not net metering at all. What instantaneous metering is, is just you get a credit for anything you export, and then you have to pay for everything you import, and it's done real time. In that scenario, there's no chance of any type of excess to be accrued, so we don't even refer to it as net metering. What we do see uh, traditionally across the country is, um, in, like I said, an annual is the best way for customers to get savings. Monthly isn't bad, but it's not, you don't get as many savings, as much saving, uh, because you're not able to, let's say, in the state of Florida, if Florida had monthly net metering, then you wouldn't be able to use those credits that you got in the wintertime and use them to offset your bills in the summertime. You'd just be able to use uh, credits that you got in, in, on January 3rd and offset credits or offset a bill uh, that, where you may have consumed more specifically on January 6th. So it operates within that month. Uh, but we also see sometimes, uh, we'll see in certain states, 15 minute intervals too. And so that's, that's traditionally how we kind of vary from, from, from net metering policy to net metering policy. So if you haven't picked up on it now, by now, net metering policies can change from state to state. And it gets even a little bit more hairy 
within each state because uh, if net metering policies can also vary from municipality to municipality. So uh, every, every municipality in theory within the state of Florida is supposed to have some sort of a net metering policy. Um, IOUs, your investor owned utilities, such as your Florida Power and Light, your, uh, your Tampa Electric Company, uh, your Duke Electric, Com Com Electric Company, they all fall in what we call a regulated market. So, but you do have other municipalities, several municipalities that operate in their own way, shape and form. In fact, about 400 municipalities that operate separately from the IOUs that also offer their own form of net metering, but they may offer a different variant uh, or different variation of net metering. So they may, they may not necessarily offer you full retail rate. So you do need to look at your electric bill. And I'll be honest with you, before I started working for SunPower, I didn't know what my electric bill said. So ever since I started working for SunPower, I've been much more in tune to it. And uh, I live in the state of DC, well, in the District of Columbia. And uh, although District of Columbia does have net metering, uh, we also, it's, the district also offers other incentives. And I'll throw that word out there too, to, uh, to incentivize homeowners uh, to, to incur or to, to put solar on their, on their houses. Uh, California is going through a similar debate right now too on what it wants to do with its net metering uh, policy. Uh, and there is, this goes back to the ongoing debate of net metering. Um, are solar customers paying their fair share to the electricity grid? And so what Florida customers, specifically within Duke and Florida Power and Light territories have recently noticed is the introduction of monthly minimums. And Duke territory, Duke, Duke customers uh, should have seen those monthly minimums to the tune of $30 a month enforced just this past January. Florida Power and Light is supposedly is supposed to implement their own version of a monthly minimum at $25 this coming June, July timeframe. So in the summertime. So through these monthly minimums, we feel that solar customers do end up paying their fair share uh, because they do contribute back to the grid. Because no matter how much you actually save, even if you zero out your bill, even if your, your electricity generation does offset your consumption, you're still having, you, st you will still need to pay those monthly minimum bills. So again, $25 in Florida Power and Light Territory and $30 in Duke Territory to, uh, to, to contribute back to the grid. And so you won't experience as many savings. It will cut down on the savings the Florida customers do receive within those service territories. The only other term that I think I'd like to I'd like to talk about too is virtual net metering. And virtual net metering uh, really applies to those those folks who live in apartment buildings and who actually contribute to uh, to community solar projects. And in just to over without belaboring it too much too, and to to keep it in simplistic simplistic terms here, community solar is basically just taking a field, putting a bunch of solar panels in it, and then uh, allowing people within a community to be able to feed off of that solar electricity that's generated. So you buy into a certain amount of equity into that solar gener solar energy, and you can participate in a net metering program also through those solar panels as well. Virtual net metering also, a little bit more, uh, it comes in the form of multi-tenant buildings, as I mentioned as well. It's a little trickier though, uh, because you would have to get into a contract with all the tenants in the building and trying to figure out who actually owns solar panels. And each, each apartment may need a meter also in order for the electric company to regulate exactly how much energy is being consumed uh, by each tenant. Uh, but technology is, is making it more and more feasible today. And the last thing I think I want to talk to you about is uh, feed-in tariffs as well. So feed-in tariffs are a term that you might you might hear uh, thrown around. And a feed-in tariff is also kind of a form of net metering, but not not exactly. And a feed-in tariff is basically you just get compensated for electricity that you export back to the grid, but it's at a fixed amount. It doesn't vary with the retail rate. It doesn't vary with the avoided cost rate. It's just hey, you get paid at. Uh, nine cents per kilowatt hour, no matter how much electricity or excess electricity that you produce or generate or how much elect excess electricity that you have at the end of every month. And so th those are some of the terms and that's, that's an explanation of what net metering has. And um, with, that, with that, I think I, I will turn it over here, Mary, and I'll stop sharing my screen.
Well, thank you so much, Jim. That was great. That gave us a lot of context for talking more specifically about what has happened in Florida. So just before we get um, to Bill, I'd like to do another quick um, poll. Thank you all for um, participating in that. And I would like to go ahead and introduce um, Bill Johnson from Brilliant Harvest. Bill has some real boots on the ground experience um, with what has been going on in Florida and advocating for rooftop solar and net metering. So I'm excited to hear um, his experience. Bill's the founder and president of Brilliant Harvest LLC. He grew up in Sarasota, Florida. He is a state licensed solar and electrical contractor and holds a master's degree in physics from the University of South Florida and an MBA in the university from the University of Florida. Bill is also certified by the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners as a photovoltaic um, installation professional, which is the highest certification available in the solar industry. He currently serves on the board of the Florida Solar Energy Association. And Bill, I'm glad you're here to explain more about what you've seen happen in Florida. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary, very much. And thanks everybody else for joining us today. So again, my name is Bill Johnson. Uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit of, uh, today about kind of Florida policy and what's been going on and <clears throat> some of the history behind, uh, you know, the latest things that have changed. Um, but a little bit about us uh, before we get started. Uh, as Mary said, we're a state certified solar contractor and electrical contractor founded in Sarasota in 2009. I am NABCEP certified. Um, we're also certified to install the Tesla Powerwall and PowerPack, which is their commercial battery system. And some of the kind of key projects that we've done, if you're from the area, uh, obviously most important, South Face Sarasota. Uh, we did the uh, rooftop solar there, uh, along with another, there was another uh, solar company that participated in that with us. But we've also done the St. Petersburg Pier Marketplace, which is the, the photo you see there. Uh, outdoor shade canopy, very cool. Uh, Girls Inc. in Sarasota, Outdoor Academy in Lakewood Ranch, uh, Children First, um, Sarasota Audubon Society uh, at the Celery Fields, and then Fire Station 8 at the Celery Fields as well. Uh, as you can tell from kind of that list, we do a lot of work for municipalities or not-for-profits. That's kind of one of our, our big focuses. Um, and so super excited to, to, talk, to talk to you guys today about, uh, about what's been going on. So let's jump right into it. The 2022 legislative session, um, Senator Jennifer Bradley and Representative Lawrence McClure introduced uh, SB 20, 1024, uh, House Bill 741. Uh, it was filed in November of 2021, um, and uh, and basically, kind of, you know, through investigative journalism and stuff, the Miami Herald discovered that the bill language was actually written by FPL. Um, and within two days of delivering the bill language to Senator Bradley, uh, she received a $10,000 campaign contribution from NextEra Energy, uh, whose official statement on the uh, on that was that they expected no favor in return uh, for the payment. Um, and by the same token, Representative McClure received the same amount uh, from a different FPL group called Associated Industries of Florida, uh, you know, just a few days later. Um, and, you know, obviously this kind of speaks to a larger issue of, <laughs> you know, the, the, the influence of money in Florida politics and, Unfortunately, FPL uh, really has kind of a lock on the state legislature, um, and uh, they spend more money uh, than any other organization in terms of lobbying and political campaign contributions uh, up in Tallahassee, as well as in Washington, D.C., actually. They have a, a pretty big operation up there as well. Um, and so they've been attacking, um, you know, net metering and stuff for a number of years. Uh, but the final language in House Bill 741, so uh, the bills kind of went through the various committee structures and stuff like that, and they were really, they were passed on party line votes. Uh, and the final uh, version of the bill was, was adopted by the Senate. So HB 741 was the final kind of bill that came out. Initially, uh, the way the language was written, the uh, net metering would have been just ended uh, on uh, January 1st or, well, actually December 31st of 2022. Uh, so starting next year, we would have had no net metering at all. But uh, the final language, uh, they, they 
Senator Bradley called it a glide path, uh, um, but they would reduce net metering to avoid the cost over a period of about six years. Um, but the other key piece of this, uh, which a lot of people didn't really think about initially and, and weren't as concerned about, was that <clears throat> the, the legislation would also have allowed the utility companies to charge monthly fees for interconnection of solar PV systems. And there was no cap on that. Uh, it was really up to the utility companies to decide. They just had to submit to the PSC uh, for approval of that. But as we all know, uh, the PSC in, in many cases is just kind of a rubber stamp for uh, what the utility companies want. Um, and so uh, there was every chance that the utility companies could have just come in and said, you know, we're going to charge you, uh, I don't know, $15 a month per kilowatt interconnection fee per month. And, and you know, if you have a 10 kW system, that's $150 a month that you'd pay. Well, guess what? That's exactly what your savings would normally have been under the original net metering program. So, um, so there was every chance that the utility companies could have really made it financially uh, actually more expensive for people to adopt solar on their rooftop, which is exactly uh, what the intention of the utilities was. Um, there was other language, uh, which we won't really go into here, uh, that would have allowed the utility companies to do cost recovery in addition to the fees. Um, and, and that actually is important a little bit later on uh, when we talk about uh, what Governor DeSantis did, uh, because he actually referred to that. Uh, the cost recovery provisions of the bill may have been what, what really ended up uh, killing it. Um, but you know the other piece of this, and, and I had mentioned this earlier, is that House Bill 741 is is really just the latest attack, uh, you know, on net metering in Florida. Um, FPL and the other uh, investor-owned utilities have had a long history of attacking rooftop solar. Uh, I personally have been in Tallahassee uh, for all of these different <laughs> uh, activities and events. Uh, I was in Tallahassee back in 2008, 2009, uh, lobbying and uh, against a legislative attack that occurred at that time. Uh, in 2012, Senator Benacquisto introduced very similar legislation to the, the House Bill 741. Thankfully, uh, I actually had a personal relationship with Senator Dietert. And uh, if, you, if you ever wanna give a beer sometime, I can tell you the amazing story of how Senator Dieter literally marched us down the hallway into Senator Benacquisto's office and, and basically killed the bill, uh, you know, before it really got a chance to, to gain momentum. Um, but, uh, and then in 2016, there was the well-known ballot initiative attack uh, where uh, the, uh, a group of, of solar advocates had actually introduced their own ballot initiative, but FPL and their kind of dark money groups uh, actually, um, uh, I guess the best word is outfunded uh, our, the solar advocate groups uh, and were able to hire away the signature gathering companies and stuff like that. Um, uh, out from under us and uh, were able to get enough signatures. And there was a lot of kind of misinformation out there. Uh, a lot of their signature gatherers were actually told to, to tell people uh, that they were gathering signatures for the pro-solar ballot initiative when instead it was actually the anti-solar initiative. Um, but thankfully, uh, even though it did make it onto uh, the, uh, the ballot that year, uh, we were able to have a pretty major grassroots campaign and, and, and we were able to stop that from uh, succeeding. Uh, and so uh, another victory uh, for us you know, in, in stopping the IOUs. And then in 2020, there was a, a public service commission workshop uh, that ostensibly was to kind of you know, discuss uh, net metering as a policy, but the, the real intent of it was to kind of open a proceeding in which they would end net metering at the state level. Um, and thankfully, again, we were able to really rally a big grassroots uh, effort uh, to stop that. And uh, we had a lot of folks come up, go up to Tallahassee and testify uh, to the Public Service Commission and stuff. And then, of course, we've got the most recent one, which is House Bill 741. And so what this really points to is the fact that, you know, the utility companies are intent on, on really trying to limit the expansion of rooftop solar in the state of Florida. Um, 
they have a good thing. They have this locked in monopoly uh, that has been established and supported and uh, protected by the state legislature. Uh, and, and they are working very hard to, to try to maintain that. And what's really interesting to me is that, uh, you know, Next Era Energy, which is the parent company of FPL, uh, one of their, you know, real kind of claims to fame is that they actually are, are the largest, you know, provider of renewable energy in the United States. Uh, you know, they, they do huge distributed uh, systems and stuff all over the rest of the United States in markets that have more open competitive policy structures. Uh, and, and, and yet they turn around and, and really don't want that kind of same competitive environment here in our backyard in Florida. Um, and so I, I just, I find that kind of dichotomy quite, quite fascinating um, that they're benefiting from the very policy that they're against here in Florida. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so the, the final result, of course, uh, you know, of this, this whole legislative session was that Governor DeSantis, uh, you know, came in and, and vetoed House Bill 741. Uh, so, you know, really, uh, we have to give him a lot of thanks. Um, he, he, he really came to our rescue. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting the language that he used in the veto letter. Um, you know, he, he really kind of focused in on this fee structure and, and the cost recovery aspects of it. Uh, and, and really talked about how inflation was hitting consumers right now particularly hard and, uh, and used that as his reasoning for, for the veto. Um, so we, we are extremely thankful uh, to Governor DeSantis uh, for sure. Uh, we may not agree with him on everything, but, uh, but on this one issue, he really, uh, really did us right. So, um, so that's kind of a, a very brief overview of, of what's been happening, uh, you know, policy-wise here in the state of Florida. Uh, you know, um, you know, certainly since I've been in the industry, um, and and we do expect that these kinds of attacks will continue. There's already discussion, uh, you know, uh, taking place about kind of revisions to House Bill 741 and reintroducing similar legislation for next year. So. Uh, as a board member of FLCIA, along with Jim, uh, you know, we really are uh, focused on trying to, to get organized, raise funds, uh, and, and, and beat back uh, the continued attacks uh, that, that keep coming from, from the investor-owned utilities. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much for sharing those stories and your insights into what has been going on. So I, we, we can definitely learn from those experiences and keep them in mind going forward. And now I'd like to introduce you to um, Kevin Campbell. She's gonna help us um, synthesize what Jim and Bill have told us and understand what the average citizen can do in or with this information. So, um, Heaven Campbell is the Florida Program Director of Solar United Neighbors. She focuses on program management, volunteer management, research, capacity building, diversity, and inclusion. She's a native Floridian, and she has a Master's of Science in Family, Youth, and Community Services. So thank you so much for being here today. I'm looking forward to hearing your perspectives. The screen's yours now. <laughs> Thanks. So I am with um, Solar United Neighbors, as Mary said, we're a national nonprofit, and we help people go solar, um, join together and fight for their energy rights. Uh, we're in 12 plus states with on the ground programming, help people, helping people go solar. Um, I usually say 13 states, but my DC team is very adamant that I say 12 states and DC. Um, and we've helped almost 7,000 families and small businesses go solar across the nation in those states, even more outside of those states um, and do some specialized programming. We do a national education and advocacy and then uh, specialized programming with farms in some other rural states. Um, we've helped install 57 megawatts of solar, educated 50,000 people directly in person um, before the pandemic. Uh, we have around 300,000 people that uh, receive our newsletter and stay in the loop on solar happenings. 
that way, so virtually. In uh, Florida, we've been um, operating since 2015. We've helped over 2,000 people, um, families, and small businesses go solar in Florida, which is equivalent to a uh, small solar farm, if you want to look at it like that, from the utility side. Um, 21 megawatts, and this is over $49 million invested back into our local economy. Uh, the cool thing about distributed solar, so solar like you see behind Bill and Mary, is that that is local and that money stays local. Um, and that's and most uh, large scale utility solar farms, uh, a lot of the time they're actually bringing in um, outside developers from out of our state. And um, often, you know, the benefits are going to parent companies outside of the state as well. Um, this is equivalent to over $89 million in lifetime savings for these families and small businesses. Um, and it's helped to create over 300 solar jobs in our state and offset over 300,000 uh, metric tons of carbon. So I wanted to talk about um, the, the kind of small scale perspective and the individual impact of what Bill and Jim have already talked about today. Our theory of change is that um, we're at the crux of this energy revolution where we're seeing our outdated model of the utility structure, which is vertical. You know, it was a product of the industrial revolution. It was something that had to be top down. Uh, we're seeing that that's no longer the case. And we think that solar is really the cornerstone of this energy revolution and how people can democratize our energy system and be a part of it from the bottom up. Um, so our theory of change is that people getting invested in that and getting invested in solar, um, whether it's through investing or community solar or going solar yourself on your business or home, uh, that is how we're going to change the system. Because once you have solar, then you are invested in protecting that. Um, so you also get plugged into the join together part of this, right? You get to be a part of this growing community. And it's, it's not just you know your neighbors that have solar, it's also the nonprofits like South Base that have solar, the installers who are your you know local solar installer like Bill, the companies that are building this new economy like SunPower, this major uh, national company. So it's really being a part of that ecosystem. And then together we can fight for change. We can fight for our energy rights and fight for what this new energy system is going to look like. Because whether or not um, we are a part of it, the energy system is changing. And a lot of that is due to solar, to this technology and um, how affordable and efficient it is. There is definitely a chance that the utility ownership model takes over what this new energy system looks like. So something that I kept saying throughout this whole net metering campaign that we just went through was this is really not a solar issue. This is an equity issue. This is not about will we have solar or won't we have solar? We'll have solar. It's just a matter of who owns that solar. So equity is at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, we are, have long battles and long history. In other states, we've been a nonprofit since 2007. And in DC, Virginia, Maryland, we've had some of these fights years and years ago before we even had a, a Florida program. And um, we know that, like I was just saying, this is really about ownership. And this is you know, an example of, of this picture here is a power plant that's sited behind this playground. And um, that's a very real, clean energy picture that we can see in the future too, where we're losing a lot of land use and um, solar farms are sited, you know, in our backyards, which it's the toolbox and it takes everything, right? Um, to get to a clean energy future, but we also have a bunch of roof space that can be utilized and could be left out of that equation. So um, in the context of this net metering fight, I want to talk a little bit about what's next and how we as individuals can get involved and why it matters to us as individuals. You know, we just talked about energy democracy a little bit and us having a stake in this new energy system. Um, so how do we exert our control in Florida and um, fight for our rights? The very next thing that's gonna happen is um, this fight is gonna go to the Public Service Commission again. So as Bill explained, this did happen in 2020. The Public Service Commission in 2020, um, said that they never received more comments on any one issue than this 
that workshop issue. Over 16,400 comments were submitted. And um, a lot of those weren't form comments. So they weren't, you know, the same thing over and over. And even if they are, that's people putting their name, address, contact information out there standing up for something. Um, the loudest advocate at the Public Service Commission in favor of solar was a commissioner named Julie Brown. And, you know, there's no investigative journalism to, to back the implication of about the state, but she has found herself promoted into a new job um, after being the loudest advocate for solar at that workshop. So it's changed a little bit, but we definitely have, you know, even though our Public Service Commission is in many ways considered kind of captured and um, as Brown University uh, and Ivy League school put it recently, an arm of our investor-owned utilities. Um, there is, are some advocates on the commission and we need to lean into them and really um, push them to, to do what's right and to listen to the overwhelming uh, voice of Floridians. So we expect this public service commission, uh, I say fight, but this uh, workshop or rulemaking to open up and happen um, because of the failure at the legislature. And there's also still a potential for a second legislative round. That's a little less likely, but definitely still a potential that we should look out for. And then while all of this is happening, so those are kind of sequential, but then throughout this, we need to be proactively engaging. So um, I wanna really focus on that and what we can do as individuals and how we can engage. So uh, we are a people movement where uh, a nonprofit that literally just represents people involved in solar, solar supporters, solar owners, um, the people who are touched by solar. So we have listened to a lot of great ideas from our network and really tried to hone in on how we can best support your action, um, but make sure that it's something that's going to make a change. So um, I'll talk a little bit about positive. Um, legislative action and how sometimes that doesn't really move and can be spinning our wills. Um, but what we've really found is the most impactful and kind of the way that we're going to move the needle is utility accountability. Um, so the time's kind of up. There's been some huge corruption schemes around the nation um, that are, are highlighting the issues that we have in our utility system. So Recently, um, in Ohio, there was a very large corruption scheme that resulted in like the speaker of their house being arrested on the floor, um, you know, stuff that makes Florida look good, <laughs> which is hard to do. So after that, the pandemic hit and there were a lot of utilities shut off during the pandemic. There was a lot of focus on that. And very recently, Congress has issued a letter asking for more information um, from specific utilities. And Duke Energy and Florida Power and Light were two of those utilities targeted by Congress. Um, and really a, a damning letter that said, what did you do with the money that we gave you? How did you still shut off this many people? And we see gross negligence, please defend yourself. Um, in addition, we're also asking, we're a part of over 200 organizations that are asking the Federal Trade Commission to investigate uh, crimes by utilities and corruption. And, and um, we highlight a few things that have happened here in Florida, like utility involvement in ghost candidates and election fraud. So this is really a, a specific area that we think is important to focus on. And it's not always the, the most fun or the most, you know, heartening. Um, so we're trying to make it really easy to understand. Uh, we've teamed up with a bunch of different niche nonprofits that do what we do and focus on energy democracy um, as a part of this energy democracy project. And we have um, created this people's utility justice playbook. And that is for us to understand why the system looks at the way it does, how we can change it, where are the, the pressure points. So I, I think we can share a link to that and I'll uh, encourage everyone to really dig into that. Um, it's super digest digestible and it's important because they have a playbook. They 100% have something literally called a playbook on how they're going to disrupt our energy rights. Uh, we also have a net metering task force that we're putting together. And this is for people who really wanna lead the fight and get their neighbors involved in Canvas and, and have you know, um, 
carpool people to Tallahassee to testify. We did this very ad hoc during this past fight um, and had to, you know, call on people to raise their hand to carpool to write a letter to the editor. So we're being proactive now and saying, will you join this task force so that in the next round you're ready to go and we're prepping you along the way and it's kind of less ad hoc. Um, and then go solar, join that theory of change, right? Get into that cycle, go solar um, or, you know, tell your neighbors about solar and help them go solar. Uh, we have these bulk purchasing programs, if you will, called solar co-ops. Um, so we have, you know, like four or five open right now. And we had one that had great timing. It had been planned. We planned these far out in advance, usually six to eight months, if not more in advance. And um, luckily we had a Pensacola solar co-op operating during this campaign. And the panhandle was really a huge pressure point on the governor um, to, to veto this bill. So that's kind of a direct example of our theory of change of getting people plugged in. And we had hundreds of people who had attended our webinars and learned about solar or joined this co-op and were now directly invested in, yes, I'll send this postcard, I'll write this letter um, to the governor. Um, and then I just wanted to really uh, lean into something that Jim touched on um, that, you know, how do we get to better policy? Uh, the bedrock of equitable solar policy is net metering. So a lot of people don't understand that net metering becomes these other things. We get a lot of questions about why, you know, why are we always defensive? Why can't we pass community solar in Florida? Um, and that's because if we get rid of net metering, then it really, uh, disrupts our chances of having any of these other policies or makes them a moot point. And I have a toddler, so sorry for the cheesy uh, heading there. I'm really good at cheesy mom jokes now. Um, but this is just a graph that shows you, you know, the bedrock, the starting point is net metering. That's what we have in Florida. And that's really our only pro-solar policy. Um, after that, you get to meter aggregation. We have some rural electric cooperatives that serve more rural areas in Florida who do opt into having meter aggregation, but we don't have any requirement for this across the state. And some of them have even rolled back offering that. Um, and uh, what this is, is you'll see like that barn there, it's very common for uh, farms. It's often referred to as agricultural aggregation. And that basically is if you have multiple meters on one property, then they can talk to each other. I have solar on my barn because it has the largest roof. So I can share that solar from my barn to this other smaller pole barn or to the meter at my irrigation pumps. It makes sense. It's your own investment on your own private property. Um, probably a lot of people will be familiar with this and the idea of schools. If a school has one main building and then maybe other portables or uh, smaller buildings, you know, they're going to put solar on their largest building uh, with the best roof exposure. That could be the gym. That could be you know, their, their main building. That solar should be able to feed into the other meters that that school owns. Um, anytime you have a very large commercial or industrial um, property, you're gonna have multiple meters. So allowing those meters to share data and to share credits uh, on the bill is just common sense and just fair. And that's not something that we have in Florida, a very agricultural state. We're one of the fourth um, largest ag producer in the nation. So something like that, just common sense stuff we don't have in, um, in, in place. So aggregation, tenant aggregation um, is, is very close to community solar. Um, these are things that we also don't have and we have to find workarounds to make them, make them happen. Um, community solar is really the gold standard for equitable solar deployment. And that is where you can use basically like virtual or a cloud to spread credits from a solar system across multiple off takers or subscribers. So like a true cooperative, imagine a, a big community that has a defunct golf course in the middle. What if they were able to take that, you know, golf course and create a big uh, solar field, a solar garden, is what they're usually called, and then have multiple homes subscribe to part of that solar garden. Um, that's something that people come up with in their brain a lot and, and ask us about because it's so 
commonsensical, but we do not have in Florida. And all of these things, if we wanted to have them, net metering is the bedrock of these better policies. Um, so I definitely wanted to kind of highlight why it's so important that we protect something that can be as nuanced and sometimes wonky as net metering um, to get us to better places and how it affects all of us individually. Um, one last thought on community solar, this is how renters and uh, people who maybe don't have a good roof for solar can also go solar. Um, so like I said, the most equitable solar deployment comes from community solar. And I will stop now and try to share some links in the chat um, based on the things that I shared here and take questions. Thank you so much, Heaven. That was all really good information. And I do also have the utility justice playbook um, on a slide that I'll, I'll show in a little bit. So we'll be sure that everybody gets access to that. So I am going to ask a question of all three of you now. Um, what, there's a pause right now. The governor just vetoed House Bill 741. We know it's coming back around again, but we have a little bit of breathing space. So. What do you think the number one thing that a Florida resident should do to get involved right now would be? I can jump in. Um, I, I think that they should get plugged into the organizations working on this so they know where to focus their people power. Um, so our organization, FLOSIA, which is the Florida Solar Energy Industry Association, um, and the organizations that are really on the front line and kind of watching what's happening and then can help direct them how to, to best um, put pressure on to protect our rights. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with, Ke with Kevin on that. Um, there's, there's a lot of different groups that are, you know, that have been involved, obviously, from an industry perspective, Flacia is, is kind of, you know, one of the, one of the leaders of the charge, but you know, obviously, FL Sun, Florida Conservation Voters, Sierra Club, um, all of those organizations see solar policy as a kind of a linchpin, um, you know, going forward. And, uh, and we had a tremendous amount of support from all of them during the battle over HB 741, for sure. Um, and, you know, groups like Sierra Club and Florida Conservation Voters have tens of thousands of, of members and, and local chapters and stuff like that. Um, and so that's an excellent way to get involved. Um, but, you know, sign up for the newsletters. Uh, you know, Flacia has a newsletter. FL Sun, I'm sure, I, I know, has a newsletter. Um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, get involved. Uh, volunteer, you know, go and speak to your elected officials. Um, you know, it's, it's, this needs to become you know, much more front and center for our, our state legislature. And they need to understand uh, that, that the people of the, United, of, of the state of Florida are really against this. I, I would just jump in and just say to, and spread the word, because even after you get involved with those, those trade associations and those associations, those informational associations, they're great in being able to, to get everybody galvanized and organized. But then it, it, the onus does really come out to people, like, like Bill said, to contact your legislators, but also hey, talk to your neighbors also yeah. and uh, use public, uh, use social media if, you, if you're savvy with it. And if you're not, then uh, and, and, you, know, you actually like to make phone calls as opposed to what people like to do today. Um, uh, then yeah, jump on the phone and have those conversations with your neighbors and let them know that, hey, this is coming down. Great, so if anybody has any questions that they wanna ask, then please feel free to put them in the chat. There were a few questions that were submitted um, prior to the um, webinar beginning today. And so I'm gonna go through those um, first. The question that got the most upvotes was what policies are in place that deal with net metering? So what is kind of the structure that's um, letting, informing what happens with net metering right now? So I guess I'll jump on that too. In Right now in Florida, I think as you, as you mentioned, Mary too, we're just taking a breather here off of HB 7, House Bill 741. Um, uh, uh, I haven't heard exactly what uh, with utility companies got planned or what they have rolled up their sleeve, but 
I, I will also say that they weren't really happy with the final version of this bill that Bill had mentioned. Uh, and so they were, you know, on some, some ways, uh, I can see them coming out and pushing a, a bill that was very, very similar to what they pushed out in December of last year, one that would essentially eliminate net metering as soon as possible. But I, 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 I definitely offered up also and defer to my colleagues here too to see if they have something different. Yeah, and, and I, I'm happy to jump in here too. Um, the, it is important to understand that depending on which utility company serves you, you may have a different kind of net metering structure. So the IOUs in Florida, because they're governed by the PSC and the state legislature, they do have full retail net metering today. But um, the a lot of the municipal uh, co-ops and things like that, uh, JEA, uh, um, Peace River Electric, um, they actually don't have full retail net metering. Um, and so, for instance, like we do some work in, in Peace River territory, which is just east of Sarasota County. Um, and uh, back, you know, uh, five years ago, we did quite a bit of solar uh, PV out there. Uh, but they, about, about four years ago, introduced a change to their policy where instead of giving you know kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour uh what they did was they they basically went to instantaneous net metering and uh and reduced the 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 payment or the value of the energy sent back to the grid by about uh 40 percent um and so uh and and it's the effect of it has been to to essentially stop uh solar you know rooftop solar installations in peace river territory uh, so it's important as a homeowner or a business owner to understand kind of what, you know, what policies in place based on, you know, based on where you're, you're getting your power from. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, the, the co-ops are not governed by the Public Service Commission, so they don't have that oversight, they don't have that uh, kind of state level uh, control. And, and like I said, a lot of them have, have, have moved away from net metering on their own. And interestingly, FPL and Duke and, and Tico were trying to use that kind of change to justify, you know, uh, some of these, some of their actions to, to try to get rid of net metering and saying, oh, yeah, you know, the, the co-ops are doing this, so we should be able to do it too. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of playing field out there right now. And then kind of along those lines, we got two similar questions. Um, how exactly in FPL's logic are non-solar users subsidizing solar users? It was never explained. And along with that, why is FPL against net metering? So I, I think that those two questions go together. Yeah, I, I would love to take a stab yeah. at this. Um, <laughs> it was never explained because it's false. It's hard to explain a made up thing. Um, from a sales logic, their argument was that they're not paying their fair share um, to maintain the grid that they use at night or whenever, you know, they like to say whenever it's cloudy, but your solar still produces whenever it's cloudy, just like you can still get sunburn on an overcast day at the beach. Um, we're not talking about, you know, heat from the sun or how blinding it is to your eye. We're talking about photons um, that move through clouds. So that always strikes me as just the most ridiculous statement that they could say being engineers themselves um but yeah i think that their their argument they tried not to talk too much about because they left a bad paper trail even just in 2021 they had put legal filings in at the public service commission that said if you let us have these minimum bills it will cost it will cover the full cost of service for all of our rate classes so that was a huge you know, more on their argument. Um, and they also, you know, Duke Energy is shared, they have, um, they service other states as well. They had testified in South Carolina that solar customers were easier and cheaper to serve because they're producing their own power and have less wear and tear on the grid. So they had uh, quite the paper trail against their own argument. Uh, so I think that very often they tried not to, not to focus too heavily on that because it was, uh, a grossly um, unsupported argument. And then also there was a lot of gaslighting of minority communities in there too, um, because FPNO had very often said that the people who were suffering from solar customers were, were 
lower income communities of color. But then again, more public service um, commission filings came up in which they had described their own demographics and the majority of their net metered customers are low to moderate income. And in um, you know South Florida, which is the main area, that's where uh, Florida Power and Light's based and their largest customer base is down there. Um, and we know that 80% of solar homeowners in South Florida do not identify as Caucasian. So they, they had a lot of holes in their story. Um, I did wanna briefly touch on the why does SPNL not like net metering? and then hand it over because I'm sure the guys have a lot to add here. Um, they, it's not that they don't like net metering. I think it's important that people understand why the utilities are against this because it seems so petty if you take it at face value. Oh, they don't want you to save money on your utility bill. It's not about our utility bills, honestly. It's about the amount of electricity that you are using from them and how badly we need them. They need to be needed because they don't care about our utility bills every month, that's chump change. They want to be able to justify, we have X amount of new customers, they're using more megawatt hours than before, we need to build a $400 million new gas peaker plant, and we have a guaranteed rate of return on that of 10.6%. 10.6% of $400 million is a lot more than we're ever going to pay in our utility bills. <laughs> so it's not about our utility bills, it's about needing them in data points so they can say build, build, build. They make their money on infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go. Well, I was just going to jump in and and you know the thing that I always kind of laughed about with the 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 not paying your your fair share thing, you know, argument is um is I, I kind of go, okay, well what about the person that just doesn't have a utility account? You know, I mean, do they need to pay, they pay their fair share? That's like, you know, to me, that's like saying, well, if I grow tomatoes in my backyard, I need to pay a fee to Publix because I'm not buying enough vegetables from them. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and and in reality, you know, Heather is, is, is absolutely right. Um, or sorry, Heaven um, is absolutely right. Uh, you know, by by someone putting solar on their own home or their business, at the margin, they are they are preventing the utility company from having to invest in new generation assets, and and that's what the utility companies are really upset about because, as as Heaven said, they're guaranteed that ten point six percent rate of return. So they are looking out in the future, going, "Hey, man, we don't we may not have any future investment opportunities." Um, but the reality is that they kind of have their heads in the sand about this because there really is a future in which we could actually work with the utilities and the utilities could own rooftop solar, right? And lease rooftops from homeowners and business owners and stuff like that. There's no reason we couldn't have a policy structure like that. Um, but it's the utility companies that have had control of the utility grid, you know, carte blanche for the last 75 years and they can't see their way out of that that kind of that black box um and so so yeah jim do you have anything to add on that yeah of course thanks thanks uh bill and heaven too and it's also people should know that solar customers they make this investment on their own they're not subsidized by anybody they pay for the bit for the material they pay for the installation and they also pay for the interconnection of of that solar system to the grid. Utility companies are not investing in that solar generation that our customers create. So I said it before and I'll say it again because it's worth hitting it twice. Why is it called a subsidy when our customers get to retain those savings, but it's not called a subsidy when the utility companies get to purchase that electricity at a lower cost and then sell it back to other customers at retail rate and they get to it they get to increase and expand their profits. So it's not a subsidy when the utility companies retain those profits, but it's called a subsidy when solar customers who generate that electricity use it to offset, to increase their savings. I don't buy it. And then the other piece, um, the and Bill has mentioned it also, and Heaven also mentioned it too, uh, the solar companies, solar industry thrives on customer economics. and uh, net metering is used, like we said before, too, to increase your savings, right? So um, in a way, 
going against net metering or attacking net metering is another way just to attack the solar industry. And because it's, it's a way to, to, to starve off customer economics. If customers don't feel that solar is a worthwhile investment, and usually we calibrate, we, we measure that investment and how long it takes you to pay off your solar system. And the average solar system in Florida can get paid off somewhere between a seven to nine to 11 years, depending upon the size of the system, depending upon the, the quality of the panels that you get, so on and so on. But when net metering, if that's taken out of the equation, that number could jump up to 13 to 15 years to pay off. And so if people uh, say your, your average individual too, who, uh, who, who, who wants to purchase net metering, and if you're in your 60s and you're looking at a 15 year investment, well, that may not be attractive to you. So, uh, so going against net metering is a way to attack the solar industry by trying to get rid of competition as well. And I just wanted to add one other thing that Bill mentioned about um, the fixed fees that were a part of the bill. So they specifically, the, I had lawmakers tell me that they were looking at Alabama and what's happening there. Alabama is actually in a federal lawsuit for an unjust uh, discriminatory solar fee that, you know, as Bill's example, uh, per kilowatt hour fee or per kilowatt um, they have a $4 per kilowatt fee. So it depends on the size of your system. So just imagine that when it comes to like a small business owner, um, somebody who, you know, maybe a restaurant who already has close margins and solar is extremely impactful because they have refrigeration and heating needs um, being penalized at a higher amount because they have a larger system or a school. Um, and it doesn't even have to be that larger system. Any amount is completely unfair. Well, they were looking at this because this is actually already being piloted in Florida. In the panhandle, we have four utilities that are rural electric cooperatives that are owned by an Alabama company. And they're definitely testing out, if we lose this lawsuit in Alabama, does that affect us in Florida? Because you know we own those utilities, but the, they have the Florida Public Service Commission. So they're testing this out already. Um, some people have, 40 plus dollars as a fee just for the audacity to have solar in the panhandle. And these are people who also have $40, I've seen these bills, uh, $40 Hurricane Michael fees and then $18 for Hurricane yeah. Sally. So they have almost $100 just in fees. Um, and you pay part of grid maintenance as part of your volumetric charge every month anyway. So how they're getting away with charging a $40 per month fee for Hurricane Michael when you know, people pay every month for grid maintenance. I don't know. Um, but this is being piloted currently and affects solar customers for sure, but also affects everyone because we've already seen utilities actually have meetings and talk about what would happen if we raised our minimum fee to $50 for everyone. How would that impact our, our profits? Um, so we've seen that happen in Winter Park, Florida, which is in Central Florida. Um, in other places. So that, that's something that should be scary to all of us and is, is very real when it comes to the economics, like Jim was just talking about, that could put you in a situation where it's like, I need someone to remove my panels because I'm being punished for them and I can't afford to even have them. Right. Um, yeah. So adding that. And, in. and if I, if I may add one other final little thought here on the, on the question of net metering, you know, one of the one of the big concerns that we had, uh, you know, when we thought HB 741 was going to pass, was was simply the unpredictability of what the kind of what the future would hold in terms of a, a customer's potential savings, and you know, and and if you look at net metering as a policy structure, it's it's about it's also about stability, right, and predictability in terms of return on investment. You know that every kilowatt hour that's generated from the system is going to be valued at X, right? But if you go to a different type of a net metering program where you're truing up on a monthly basis or a daily basis or an instantaneous basis, you lose that predictability in terms of the financial return because you could have a situation where the system is producing a lot of excess electricity, and but the HVAC is running and, and, and in your house, the air conditioning is running. And so you're getting full retail value in that situation. But then all of a sudden the, the air conditioning turns off. Now you're sending it back to the grid for that extra 15 minutes. And, and now you're, who knows what your savings is going to be. 
So, so that's another big piece of this is that, you know, when, when people make these investments on their own homes and their businesses, they need to have a predictable, you know, kind of financial, you know, picture for, for what their savings are going to be. And, and I can tell you just our personal experience in the time, you know, from when the bill was filed to, to the veto, you know, we had a lot of clients say to us, look, we're going to, we're going to just hold off on doing a project because we're not sure what the impact of this is going to be. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's another key, key component of this whole discussion is that, you know, the folks that are making these investments need that predictability going forward. And utility company, we love this question, right? Because there's so much, so many ways to answer too. But so utility companies also like to advertise, they, they're asking the question, but why should we pay retail rates for net metering when it only costs us, let's say, so why should we pay 12 cents per kilowatt hour when it only costs us, the utility companies, let's say, three to four cents to produce that same level of, of electricity? Um, so why should we pay retail rate? Why should we purchase that electricity from solar customers? But what utility companies leave out or neglect to mention is that that electricity they generate doesn't really cost three to four cents per kilowatt hour because it doesn't include transmission costs. It doesn't include upgrades to the transmission network. So they've conveniently left that piece out, which, uh, which is an overwhelming cost. And that's also how utility companies make their profit. It's off of their infrastructure. Thank you. I see a, a question in the chat and it is long and technical, but I do want to break the rule that I made about um, unmuting yourself. Katie, okay, if there's a way to ask that question, um, explaining some of the terms that you use, but also keeping it kind of short, I don't know, it, it, would you mind sharing your question? Hi, and I'm sorry to, to cause you to break the rules. I read Katie Southwood's <laughs> advocacy program director at South Face. I was I joined a little bit late, so I probably didn't hear the, the rule part of the rule process. So my, um, I apologize. Um, and these are such fabulous presentations. I've learned a lot, and so thank you. Um, I was wondering. This is for for all of all of the panelists. Um, given that we're hearing that this will likely come up again, whether it be as at the legislature or it may come up in a rulemaking or both uh, down the line, thinking ahead, I'm hearing organizing and getting community involvement sort of outside game advocacy, but in terms of preparing for inside game advocacy, it, at the Florida Public Service Commission, if there is a proceeding there or with the legislature, would a study on the benefits that distributed energy resources and their aggregations, which haven't, so, eloquently mapped out how this opens and unlocks so many other really beneficial ways of using distributed resources. Would a study showing that, that solar actually can help the system have reliability and resilience and that, and I, so I noted, would that be actually influential? Or is that something that would have sway at the PSC or is, or is, <laughs> or is that that's not a, that's the level a great question. of conversation you have? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, many of us in testimony before the various subcommittees up in Tallahassee during session advocated for exactly that, uh, that we needed to have an independent study. Actually, uh, a lot of us, actually most of us on, the, on, on our side of this argument uh, really advocated for an independent entity like the University of Florida or Florida State or USF or UCF to actually kind of run that study because we are concerned about the Public Service Commission not being independent. Um, you know, they are they are uh, very much captured by the utility companies. Um, and so, but but absolutely, we 100% we agree that, that that kind of study is actually what's needed. What's interesting though, is that the legislature completely ignored all of that input. Uh, you know, there was, there was clear, um, kind of, you know, resistance to that from the bill sponsor uh, on both the House and the Senate side. I mean, I, I sat there while Senator Bradley actually said in testimony, you know, uh, no, we don't need a study. Um, you know, the, the, this, this question was, was kind of predetermined when net metering was originally created in the state of Florida, um, you know, that, that uh, and her, the way, the way she argued it was that 
Um, net metering was set up to kind of uh, jumpstart the solar industry. And now that, um, and it was, it, and, and that jumpstart was a presumption that there was a subsidy taking place. Um, that, you know, by, by giving them this extra boost, uh, we're going to jumpstart the solar industry. And so really the, you know, that, that extra boost is, is no longer needed. So we should get rid of net metering. That was the argument that they had. And so their, their whole thing was, we don't, we don't need a study. In fact, we don't want one, but absolutely. We agree that one would, would be beneficial. The key though, of course, is, you know, what inputs go into that study and what factors are actually being considered. Um, because it's, it's very clear that, you know, with the wrong kinds of inputs, uh, they could reach all kinds of conclusions uh, that really are misleading and, and, and misinform, you know, the process going forward. Thank you. I have learned so much today. I really appreciate all of you being here. I've gone ahead and put up the resources page and I'll leave that up for a few minutes. The, this is being recorded, so everybody will receive a link and you'll be able to watch this again and share it and certainly see the resources page again if you're not able to write it all down right now. Um, thank you so much to Jim and Bill and Heaven. And also thank you, Lacey and Davis, who both helped with getting this webinar together. And of course, thank you to the audience members watching in real time and to those that are seeing this at some point in the future. So everyone, please get involved, reach out to your lawmakers, to utility companies, vote at the ballot box and vote with your dollars. Um, I hope you all have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.